Terrific. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'd like to start off this talk with, with this picture, which is uh, actually a teaching uh, uh, skeleton created by Ed Mueller at the FDA way back in the 1980s. And so if you look closely, you can see all of the different medical devices that were available at that time, artificial ribs, pumps, pacemakers, tubes, vascular grafts. And so, you know, even at that time, there were a remarkable number of medical devices and people, and this list has just been growing exponentially. And really a fundamental question when we think about building medical devices is what do you build it out of? And so I wanna give a couple early examples of what scientists and doctors use to build medical devices. Vascular grafts, there was a surgeon in Texas who wanted something he could sew with. And so, uh, of course, what would you think of if you needed to sew uh, a clothing? And so the, the first vascular grafts were actually made of Dacron. And, and this trend really drove early medical devices. Um, the first artificial heart, the scientists knew they needed something that had a good flex life. Well, what has a good flex life? And what's flexible? Well, they thought of a lady's girdle. And so the first, first artificial heart was made of polyether urethane, which is uh, what gives that lady's girdle nice flexibility. Sure, thank you. Um, and, and this led to a lot of really important advances, but it also became clear that, that often these, what we call off the shelf materials could be inadequate for medical application. So polyether urethane actually is a great flexible material, but biologically when blood interacts with it, it can lead to clots and these clots can go to the brains of patients. And so a real revolution in this field has been what we call the rational design of biomaterials. So now instead of building your medical device out of something that already existed, you really sit down and think, you know, what are the design principles for the perfect material for each specific device? And so one of the earliest uh, examples of synthetic rationally designed biomaterials in my mind are the degradable sutures. So these are polymeric sugars that can be uh, made into string and then sewn into your body. Uh, when it, these will naturally degrade and be absorbed. A more recent example of uh, rationally designed sutures are these shape memory sutures developed by Andreas Lenlin when he was back at MIT uh, in the early 2000s. So these are also biodegradable sutures, but they have the additional property of having shape memory. And so when you shift them from room temperature to body temperature, they can take on a new conformation. So for example, on the left, or, uh, you can see a suture that is turning into a screw. And on the right, we have a suture that will actually tie itself into a knot. And so to me, these are nice visual examples of how the rational design of materials is gonna continue to change medicine. You know, the first application that I want to talk about are the development of materials for tissue engineering and how we might use materials when combined with cells to create new types of living medical devices. And so I actually start off with a picture of Voldemort. I assume you guys have all watched this with your kids. Um, this is instead of some of the horrific injuries, facial injuries that sometimes uh, we see in patients, but Voldemort does suffer from a lack of a nose and the reality is, is if a surgeon can't reconstruct with existing tissue, sometimes patients will be stuck using what really are in some ways um, prosthetic masks or plastic devices. And so I think the, the field of tissue engineering has been working on problems like this for a long time. And, and one very famous example is this ear, which is actually made of biodegradable polymers and combined with living cells. In this case, they're chondrocytes from cartilage, and under the right conditions, these can be grown into mimetics of, of cartilage and actually placed into animals and even people. And this is really a huge area of medicine, and I know there are also some experts in the audience here that focus on this. But the, the part I'd like to talk about today is our work on building what we think of as living medical devices that deliver drugs on demand. So imagine having a pump in your body that will deliver the right amount of drug in the right time. But the difference here is this is not a pump that we use electricity to fire or we load up with exogenous drug. We actually envision creating a living device where the cells are producing the drug on demand and they're actually responding to the environment to give you as much drug, the right amount of drug uh, that you need for a specific application. 
And so the real motivation for this work for us was our efforts to try to develop a therapy for diabetes. And so as I expect most of you know, diabetes is the loss of blood sugar control. And um, in type one patients, this is caused by autoimmune destruction of the insulin producing cells, the beta cells. And so the goal is really to create a replacement pancreas, or at least the parts of the pancreas that make insulin. And, and again, the goal is also not to make a customized pancreas for every sick person. There are millions of these patients. Can we make one device and mass produce it and have it work in everybody? That's the dream. And so I think as engineers, we first think of the design criteria. What are we gonna to do to build this medical device? Well, first and foremost, you know, we need to recognize that this is, uh, this is a living device. It isn't run by electricity, as I mentioned. Uh, what it needs is oxygen and food uh, because these are cells that are gonna be secreting insulin. And in our bodies, I expect you all know that um, the key way we deliver nutrients and oxygen to our cells is through uh, the vascular beds. And you know, I think this is a, a very smart way to think about designing a synthetic pancreas, but unfortunately it continues to be difficult to make very complex three-dimensional vascular beds that maintain uh, for long amounts of time and integrate with synthetic devices. And so the reason this is a fundamental challenge, there's an old rule of thumb I was taught a long time ago, which is if you wanna build a tissue that's thicker than around half a millimeter, what you start to see is on the area, and I've drawn this from blue to red, the area closest to the blood vessel will get nutrients and oxygen, but then there's competition for that nutrient supply. And when you get past about half a millimeter, depending on the tissue, you start to get cell death and starvation. And so if you can't build a capillary bed and you need to supply food and nutrients to all of these cells, what do you do? Well, one idea is just to make it thin. You know, there's no reason why a new pancreas needs to look like the old one. And this has really sort of driven the design of these types of devices for decades. This is an example of perhaps the most common approach was, which is instead, to make one, instead of making one pancreas to replace the parts of, of the pancreas that are dysfunctional, we'll make lots of mini pancreas and then place these in the patient. In this case, these are um, hydrogels. So these are polymers that contain a lot of water, and inside, in this case, it's pig cells. These cells are uh, pig islets that can measure in a way, react to the blood sugar in your body, and then secrete insulin in response. And so, as I mentioned, um, we need to keep this oxygenated. Uh, we also need to have the drug come out on, in response. Um, and Importantly, we need to block elements of the immune system from killing these cells. Because we want to make one device that works in everybody, we need to protect it from the immune system or otherwise we'll get tissue rejection. And so as engineers, we think about creating a semi-permeable barrier of sorts that can allow what we want to come in that keep these elements in the immune system away. And the reason we need to do this is, I think, uh, represented in this beautiful video by Eric Betzig at the NIH, who got the Nobel Prize. In this case, what you're looking at is a uh, T cell attacking a cancer cell. And so, uh, as you can imagine, this uh, T cell is in our bodies actively looking for invaders, whether they're foreign cells, objects, uh, or cancer cells. In this case, we're, we're thinking about delivering insulin producing cells. But we need to physically separate these T cells or otherwise mask the transplanted cells from the immune system. And the most common material that, that we and others have used, I think if you look back over the last several decades um, on the materials that people have used, the most common is actually something called alginate. Um, it's not actually from this type of seaweed, but if you've ever gone to a Japanese restaurant and had a seaweed salad, you'll notice that this, al this, uh, this uh, very water-rich, sort of elastic property. And so this polymer alginate can be isolated from these types of seaweeds. And through controlled droplet generation and the incorporation of cells, you can actually wrap cells uh, with this polymer. And this polymer now creates this semi-permeable membrane where the nutrients can come in and the insulin can come out. 
And this is not, this is not new, new work. In fact, there's a, a, a seminal paper um, from now over 40 years ago. It was published in Science by Lim and Sun. And what they did is they took islets encapsulated in this alginate and they placed it into a diabetic rodent. And here's actually a figure from that paper long ago. And just to orient those of you that aren't biologists, on the y-axis, you're looking at the blood sugar. And then on the x-axis, you're looking at time after implantation. And so what they found was that you could transplant either encapsulated islets in these little spheres or just free islets. And soon after transplantation, the immune system would attack and kill them. That's what's shown in the uh, dashed line. However, um, what you can see in the solid line is now you actually get a maintenance of function. Lasts a couple weeks, but still it was a really important seminal moment in the field that you could take islets from one animal, wrap them in a polymer, put them into a diabetic animal and actually get control of blood sugar. So when we take these approaches and use more advanced approaches as we do today, you can actually take the pancreas of a pig, isolate these insulin producing cells, put them into a droplet generator that makes these little microspheres of gel. You can then place these into a diabetic rodent, which is a completely different species. And again, when we look at the blood sugar of these animals, now we can get control of blood sugar for as long as we do the experiment. So this lasted over 300 days in our hands. And so this is an exciting proof of principle that you can get long-term control of diabetes from a simple, small sphere. But there are some things I didn't show you. There's things we learned and things, things we still haven't solved. So first of all, what this teaches us is that we can take a pancreas, isolate the cells, and encapsulate them. You can actually take islet cells from a completely different animal and cure diabetes in a rodent. But there was a catch. So in this experiment, the rodents didn't have an immune system. And so if you do this exact same experiment in a normal mouse with a strong immune system, uh, what ends up happening is just like back in 1980, the devices fail. And so why is that? Well, our immune systems are smart. And if our immune cells can't um, attack and clear something, often they'll wall it off in a layer of scar tissue. And this is a process called fibrosis. And so in the case of this artificial pancreas, what happens is you get a layer of collagenous tissue or scar tissue that wraps around the cells and now starves the cells to death. And so the devices no longer work on the order of about a few weeks. And in fact, early studies in humans with these types of capsules showed exactly this. So you can look in the abdominal cavity where these devices were placed. And if you look at the wall of the abdomen, maybe hard to see in the back of the room, you can see these little lumps of material that have embedded in the wall and they're covered in scar tissue. And some of these were taken out. And when you look at them, you see layers of scar tissue and then dead cells inside. So, so what do we do? Well, can we find a material that's actually gonna evade the immune system? This is a picture of one immune cell called a macrophage interacting uh, with bacteria, but also interacting with the surface. Uh, that it can touch. You can see it sort of reaching out to grab it. And so our goal is to try to find new materials that can actually be in a way invisible to the immune system so that we can build these devices and not get all of the scar tissue formation. And so this is a more technical slide of, of how we did this. It's also a slide that represents probably 15 people over five or six years. So I sometimes feel bad showing this when my graduate students did all of this work, but it's a single slide. Uh, basically, what we did is combinatorial chemistry to make libraries of materials. We use automation or robots to assist in this process. We isolate these polymers and then do a series of tests to see if they could still form capsules and gels. We then place them in animals to see how they interact with the immune system, ultimately taking materials that are looking promising and seeing if they can actually cure diabetes first in rodents and then if they can keep cells alive in primates. And so with these new materials now, we're able to do an experiment like this where we can actually take the beta cells out of a primate, encapsulate these into this new material, place them into a second primate that would normally reject these cells and see that at least for four months, the cells are alive and happy. And so 
this was an exciting first step. We now have a device, but where do the cells come from? So historically, when patients have been treated for diabetes with cells, those cells come from uh, cadavers. But, you know, for many years, people were taking pig insulin, and so there was this belief that perhaps we could just actually take, uh, take the, the, the pancreas of pigs, isolate beta cells, and treat patients. But fortunately, right around the time we developed this device, um, there had been recent important progress developing sugar uh, insulin producing cells from stem cells. And what's exciting here is if you have an embryonic stem cell, you can actually reproduce it indefinitely. So imagine instead of sort of waiting for people to die so that you can cure others, perhaps an endless amount of cells can be grown in a vat. And my colleague, Doug Melton, who was at Harvard, he's now moved to a company called Vertex, took on uh, really a, a, an incredible amount of effort to figure the precise process by which you can turn a stem cell into a beta-like cell that can now secrete insulin on demand. And I'm not going to step through the biology of that process, but it was a really important moment in the field. And there's some very recent data showing that these cells in humans are functioning. We showed back in 2016, in collaboration with him, that we can now take these new polymers and human cells and cure the diabetes of a mouse with a strong immune system. And this was published in Nature Medicine back then. Um, we went on to form a company called Sigalon that um, is working with Eli Lilly to advance these to the clinic. And I expect this will happen soon. So I want to shift gears now to talk about how materials can be used to deliver other types of compounds and drugs. And in particular, how we can use biomaterials to deliver drugs inside of cells as therapeutics. And so while it sounds like science fiction, nowadays actually most of the people in the audience have had nanoparticles deliver cell uh, uh, materials into their bodies in the form of a COVID vaccine. So the COVID mRNA COVID vaccines, at least in the United States, have been widely adopted. Um, these are nanoparticles containing messenger RNA that provide an immune response to the COVID spike antigen. And just in, I wasn't sure how many engineers we had versus biologists, but I wanted to first give one background slide on molecular biology. When we teach biology in the United States, uh, there's a term called the central dogma of molecular biology. And apparently they continue to use this term. It so just describes the basic observation that DNA encodes all of the information in our cells, DNA is turned into messenger RNA, which is then turned into protein. And it's really the proteins that do the majority of the work, but not all of it in cells. So proteins are things like insulin. They can be fibers in your muscles that help them contract. They can be the things that help nerves grow. So it's the protein that's, that's really doing the work. But this messenger RNA is the intermediate step. And <clears throat> there's this huge interest now in, in using messenger RNA as a modular pharmaceutic. So the idea is, since DNA turns into mRNA, turns into protein in all of our cells, if we could just deliver messenger RNA inside of a cell, we could now make any protein we want. Whether it's a protein for a vaccine for a disease, it could be a protein to treat a genetic disorder, it could be a protein to, uh, to address cancer. But again, the reason we think of this as modular, and this is a term coined by my colleague Phil Sharp at uh, MIT, just by changing the sequence of the RNA, you can make a new protein. So it's the same basic drug. You change the order of the uh, letters in the messenger RNA and you make a new drug to a new disease. However, it's a tough problem. How do we actually think about delivering messenger RNA as a therapeutic? If we conceptualize the challenges, it seems like it's, it's, a, a, it, it's not gonna be possible. First, we need to build a nanoparticle we imagine injecting it into the body. It needs to travel through the body to our destination tissue. It needs to then leave, for example, the bloodstream and interact with cells. Um, it needs to be eaten, actually, by cells through a process called endocytosis. Once in a cell, it actually needs to escape the cellular stomach, which is called the endosome. And then the nanoparticle needs to fall apart, ultimately releasing the nucleic acid so it can work. And so, as I mentioned, it, it in some ways sounds like science fiction, but there's been progress. And the areas where we first saw progress 
are actually in organs that naturally filter the blood. So there are organs in our bodies like the liver, the kidneys, the spleen, <clears throat> sometimes the bone marrow. Depending on the property of the nanoparticle, um, you will often see accumulation of nanoparticles in these organs after you inject them into the blood. However, this is really only the first step. So having a nanoparticle get in the vicinity of cells is a first step, but what we actually need is to release the payload inside of cells. And that's really been the fundamental challenge. And unfortunately, nucleic acids like RNA and DNA are in some ways the worst drug molecules. <clears throat> so for any of you chemists in the audience, you may recognize that these small molecule drugs that we commonly take uh, are very small on a molecular size. They have certain uh, hydrophobicities or water uh, attractiveness. Um, there are enzymes in our blood and our cells that are designed to react to foreign RNA and DNA and actually chew it up or cause a massive immune response. But, you know, if we think about how we might deliver these molecules, how might we do it? <clears throat> well, um, it turns out that one of the most helpful molecules uh, are compounds called lipids. <clears throat> and so just to introduce you to lipids, first from a biology perspective, <clears throat> if you look at a cell at a molecular level and you think about that outer layer of a cell, I, I've described it as the skin of a cell. Um, there is this interesting structure which is called the bilayer. So if you see all of these blue dots, basically these are a molecule oriented out and a molecule oriented in, and they form a lipid bilayer. And so these are um, uh, molecules that through simple mixing can actually start to assemble into more complex structures. And in fact, um, these can also through controlled mixing be assembled into nanoparticles. Um, these are called liposomes or lipid nanoparticles. They can be on the order of nanometers, uh, typically on the order of 80 nanometers. And in fact, um, the first FDA approved um, lipid nanoparticle dates back to 1995, I believe, which is a drug called Doxel, designed to deliver a chemotherapeutic. But over the past few decades, a variety of scientists, including us, have been trying to develop lipid nanoparticles to deliver RNA and DNA. And so if you conceptualize the, the composition of these nucleic acid containing um, lipid nanoparticles, they're generally conf uh, composed of four different lipids and a nucleic acid. So I haven't drawn the structures here, but first and foremost, there's something called the ionizable lipid. This uh, is one of the central players in this lipid nanoparticle. It has a positive charge or a conditionally positive charge. It can interact with a negative charge on the RNA by simple mixing, they start to come together. And this helps what we call self-assemble these compounds into a nanoparticle. Uh, we also have other components. We call them helper lipids. They play various roles in stability and function. And there's also something called the polyethylene glycol lipid, which some of you may have heard of uh, as there was some finger pointing at this particular component as the reactive part of the COVID vaccine. But that's a longer, a longer story. So all of these four lipids can be combined with RNA through controlled mixing to make nanoparticles. And you know, when we first started this work, we and others recognized that it was really this ionizable lipid that was one of the key players in making nanoparticles that can deliver to people. And so I apologize to anyone who's not a chemist in the audience, but I thought I had to show at least one or two chemistry slides. So these are chemical structures of various lipids uh, delivery lipids that were around when I started this work. Um, and of course, this is something that people have been working on for decades. And when I looked at the chemical structures at that time, I recognized that there wasn't quite as much chemical diversity as I thought there should be. So for example, this uh, lipid in the top left is called DOTMA. This was developed in the 1980s. It's one of the early delivery materials for DNA and antisense molecules. The material right next to it is called DLIN DMA. This was a very important early delivery material that was used to show the potential of something called small interfering RNA, published in Nature back around 2006. And so if you're a chemist and you look at these structures, you, you might notice that they're really only different by a few atoms. And so that's not to take away from the importance of these structures, but rather at the time, the first challenge was actually making these things and making diverse molecules that could be interesting. And so it was really a chemistry challenge. <clears throat> And this is uh, only my second chemistry slide. 
I won't show more than this, but really the challenge is how do you make thousands of these things and how do you do it quickly? So we don't wanna have to customize our synthetic reactions for, for all of these compounds. Can we come up with strategies to allow us to make relevant molecules in one step and not require a lot of painful chemistry steps like purification? This is called a Michael type addition. Um, for the chemists, again, you can notice certain parallels and structures to this uh, compound in the, in the top right with the blue. Um, but so this is just one example of the, and I really just wanted to describe the approach. We've since made thousands of these things and shown their potential for the delivery of nucleic acids. In fact, we have over eight that are in clinical trials right now as different vaccine delivery systems. <laughs> but what I wanna switch to is that, you know, I see this as the tip of the iceberg. I believe these nanoparticles are gonna be useful to deliver nucleic acids for all types, many types of diseases and to many different tissues. So they're not just for vaccines. Here's just an example of an experiment where we took two different nanoparticles and by changing the chemistry, in this experiment, we, um, we made two nanoparticles with different chemistry, but they have the same messenger RNA. In this case, it encodes for uh, luciferase. Luciferase is a protein. Uh, it's what allows fireflies to give off light. And so we use this often as a reporter construct. And if we can successfully deliver nanoparticles, we actually can measure how much light comes out of the tissue. So if you deliver this to an animal, and you start to see a glowing liver or a glowing lung, that means your nanoparticles are working. And so in this experiment, we took our two different nanoparticles and then we isolate the organs and see whether or not they glow. And what you can see on your left is um, the first nanoparticle will deliver this luciferase to the lungs of the animals, whereas the second nanoparticle doesn't deliver at all. In contrast, when we look at the liver, the first nanoparticle does not deliver to the liver, but the second nanoparticle does. And so the point is just that by changing the chemistry, it's possible to have nanoparticles travel to other parts of the body. And there's a lot of work right now looking to adapt these types of delivery systems to a range of different diseases to various organs. <clears throat> Another example of how you might use these types of nanoparticles is actually through inhalation. So this is in some ways a, a related experiment where we made nanoparticles that when you breathe them in, they will deliver messenger RNA. And so in this case, we use a process called nebulization where we have a solution of nanoparticles and then it makes little water droplets. Uh, there may be someone here who's had asthma and has used a nebulizer to deliver arbuterol. It's the same general approach. But again, when we do this in rodents, you can see that it's really only the lung that uh, is providing luciferase activity. And so the idea here is perhaps these could be used to treat genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis or others. So <clears throat> I think um, there's a lot of demonstration that nanoparticles can deliver messenger RNA. Um, I want to describe a new type of RNA, uh, which we call circular RNA or, or ORNA. And so circular RNA, uh, for those of you <coughs> that are biologists, you all know that messenger RNA is essentially a line. <clears throat> However, if you look in your bodies, um, there are actually a lot of these circles and it's not completely clear what they do. Um, however, it is clear that they are present in many, many tissues, in particular in the brain. And <clears throat> what's interesting about circular RNA is that they're able to encode for proteins. However, uh, they have some fundamental differences from messenger RNA that give them potential advantages. So first of all, <clears throat> messenger RNA has these ends, and the way that messenger RNA is attacked in the body is, fr is from the ends. So you can imagine these scissors that are chewing in from the ends of your lines. Well, if you make a construct that has no ends, then these so-called exonucleases cannot attack the RNA. Um, there are also a lot of molecular differences in how they are turned into protein that I'm not going to talk about. But fundamentally, um, these are a really interesting way to think about delivering new proteins in a way that could be longer living uh, than conventional messenger RNA. And so we developed <clears throat> the first easy method for creating circles out of lines. And so there's a process uh, whereby you can incorporate a ribozyme that allows for cell splicing. In essence, you can have an RNA that automatically turns itself into a circle by itself under the right conditions. 
And so we published a couple papers about this process and how to purify them and also how uh, you could use these to deliver protein in mammalian cells. We went on to start a company called Orna. And at Orna, what we've shown is that these circles are actually very potent ways to deliver proteins to T cells. So these immune cells in our bodies. And so uh, this is an example looking at a reporter construct and delivery to T cells in a dish, human T cells. And what we're looking at is a comparison of the amount of protein produced over time for a conventional state-of-the-art messenger RNA or different circles. And so these circles are shown in purple you can imagine that the total amount of protein is really that area under the curve. And so with these circles and T cells, we're getting orders of magnitude more protein over time. And that gives us hope that we can deliver important proteins to T cells. So what might we want to do? Well, I thought I would show this video again. So this is an example of a T cell attacking a cancer cell. And so what, the first thing that Orna is focused on right now is actually reprogramming T cells in the body to attack different cancers. And so there are really exciting data showing that in humans, you can take T cells out of a patient, change them genetically, and then put them back into a patient. But it's a really tedious process, involves a lot of potential side effects. However, it is an actual powerful way to treat cancer. Here, we're hopeful that we can actually just inject a nanoparticle with a circle and make these cancer attacking T cells in the body. And this is something that I'm optimistic Orna is gonna be doing in the next year or two. Um, uh, here's an example uh, of some preclinical mouse data where we have a humanized immune system and we have a human uh, B-cell leukemia and then we inject um, these circular RNA-containing nanoparticles and it's only with the correct constructs, which is the bottom flat line, so this is a CD19-targeted nanoparticle, where the tumors are completely destroyed. Any of these other constructs, we see growth of the tumors. And so, as I mentioned, Orna now has over 100 people. We're excited by the potential of this technology to treat cancer. But actually, uh, we see lots of opportunities for using these circles. Orna has announced a collaboration with Merck to use them, for example, in vaccines and some other areas. In fact, this was the biggest preclinical deal in biotech history, I believe. <clears throat> So I'm going to end um, finally by talking about the delivery using materials of genome editors. And actually, <clears throat> this question that I've posed here, can we make drugs that change your DNA while you're still using it? This is actually what brought me to MIT back in 1999. I was a biologist by training, and I had worked on DNA repair. And I had this dream of using DNA repair pathways to treat disease. And you know, it's, it's rather amazing to me now that we're actually starting to see this come to fruition. The dream here is that can you inject a drug into a patient, let's say you have a liver disease, which is why I've drawn this liver in green. Can you have something like these editing nanoparticles travel through the body, reach the liver, <clears throat> enter the disease cells, delivering your genome editing complex that specifically latches on to the right part of the DNA you're trying to fix, repairs it, and then now you have a healthy organ. <clears throat> well, we think it's possible. And again, we think it's going to be these same types of lipid nanoparticles that do it. <clears throat> Just to draw a little bit more of a, a, a diagram parallel for you, the idea is we have a DNA editor. So this is going to interact with the DNA to cause our repair event. We need to get it inside of the cell where it's going to specifically attack the DNA, leading to a repaired messenger RNA which now leads to a repaired protein, leading to a permanent correction of, of whatever disease we're trying to treat. So <clears throat> there are uh, a vast way, uh, uh, endless array of different approaches to genome editing. I'm gonna talk about one of the simpler ones, but most of them typically involve editing your DNA by co-opting existing DNA repair pathways. So as you might expect, we're all constantly trying to repair our DNA, whether you're out in the sun or you get exposed to x-rays. <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, different mechanisms by what, by way the body repairs these constructs. And the, the, goal, the goal here is to <clears throat> basically use our existing DNA repair machinery to do a therapeutic DNA editing event. And <clears throat> one of the most straightforward 
ways to do this is by creating what we call a double strand of break in the DNA in a precise location. And so if you just focused in on the left, this is called, <clears throat> actually I'm gonna go into this in more, more detail, but in essence, uh, what I want you to envision is what we really need is a pair of scissors that's gonna specifically cut the DNA where we want it. And of course, you can imagine that cutting the DNA uh, could be dangerous. And in fact, we have a lot of DNA. We've got 3.2 billion base pairs times two. And so what we really want is a pair of scissors that's only gonna cut where we want and it's not gonna cut where we don't want. <clears throat> Well, um, there are a variety of different ways to do this. I think uh, one of the more exciting ways is uh, through the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So some of you may know the Nobel Prize in 2020 was given to Manuel uh, Serpentier and Jennifer Doudna for the <coughs> use of CRISPR for genome editing. And you know, the CRISPR-Cas9 story is an interesting one. This is really a, a, a bacterial enzyme that have been designed to help deal with viral attack. <clears throat> but um, the way we can use it actually is a programmable pair of double-strand DNA scissors. So imagine a protein that you can program where to cut. And the way you program it is actually with what we call the guide RNA. The guide RNA is something that complexes this molecule Cas9 and tells it where to cut. So if we program our guide RNA correctly, we will cut where we want. <clears throat> So if we want to build this genome editing nanoparticle, what do we have to include? Well, um, we need to deliver the Cas9 protein. And so uh, what we decided was to use messenger RNA to deliver Cas9. But we weren't sure how to deliver the guide RNA. And that was really the open question. I'm going to go quickly through the next two slides. But <clears throat> for those of you familiar with guide RNA, guide RNA is a st single-stranded form of RNA, about 100 nucleotides. Um, it has a complex secondary structure and how it interacts with Cas9. <clears throat> and, you know, we came at it more from a delivery perspective and a chemistry perspective. There was knowledge that changing the chemistry of RNA can make it work better uh, from a delivery perspective. But the problem is that if you have 100 different places to change it and, say, 20 different ways you can change it at each of those spaces, you now have an enormous number of possible modifications. And so through examining the crystal structure of the interaction between the guide and Cas9, we were able to make certain predictions about how to add chemistry to the guide RNA to get it to work uh, well. And here's an example of how we used it. We were interested in targeting familial hypercholesterolemia. So can you create a nanoparticle that permanently lowers cholesterol? And the goal is not to do this in people like myself that maybe don't eat so good. Um, there are patients who have familial hypocholesterolemia that can lead to dramatic reduction in lifespan, that can lead to cholesterol accumulation, as shown here in the hands. There's a gene called PCSK9. <clears throat> it's involved in cholesterol metabolism. And you can take antibodies today that will lower your cholesterol by 50, 60%. But the problem is you need to take them for the rest of your life. So can we have a nanoparticle change the DNA, block this PCSK9, and thereby lower cholesterol permanently. <clears throat> and so using these chemically modified guide RNAs, a messenger RNA encoding Cas9, and a lipid nanoparticle, we were able to show that in mice, we can actually get specific editing in the liver of this exact site. Um, in fact, we could see that over 80% of the copies in the liver were knocked out. Uh, PCSK9, which can be measured in the blood, was no longer detectable in the blood. Um, and cholesterol was lowered in these animals. And so this was an early demonstration, at least to our knowledge, the first demonstration using a nanoparticle to do CRISPR genome editing uh, to address a disease. In fact, there's a company called Verve Therapeutics that using a slightly different approach to specifically knock out PCSK9 in humans. They've now dosed their first patients. But <clears throat> another important disease is something called transthyretin-mediated amyloidosis. It has this long, painful name, but I think what you need to understand about TTR is that it's caused by misfolded proteins in the liver, and this can lead to amyloids similar to what you get in Alzheimer's. But these amyloids then leave the liver and affect various parts of the body, including nerves in this patient, the eyes. And after um, symptom onset, unfortunately, uh, typically have a very bad prognosis. Well, one idea is actually to knock this TTR gene out in the liver 
using the nanoparticle. So permanently correct, basically lowering levels to, to address the disease. And a company called Intellia has now done this. Again, taking a lipid nanoparticle with a messenger RNA including Cas9, a guide RNA with chemical modifications, similar to what we described. But now they've put this in patients and this is actually their human data looking at TTR levels in humans. And so what you can see, it's probably a little hard to see in the back of the room, you're looking at TTR reduction. And what you can see at the higher doses, basically you're getting over around 90% reduction in TTR in patients. <clears throat> They've since gone on to do another disease, which I won't talk about today, but I think this is a nice example of how these types of nanoparticles are really now being used in humans to do therapeutic genome editing. And I believe this is, this is just the beginning. So with that, I wanna thank all of you for your attention. Um, this is actually an old slide of my lab. And of course, I describe a whole lot of work, but it's really all of the students and postdocs and collaborators that deserve, deserve the credit. So thank you again.